wanted to uh, to talk to Sittenschneider, talk to you guys about Sittenschneider. Um, so the the idea of today is that we will um, well, it's to get a, a, get a taste of Sittenschneider, to get a taste of his his style, um, his repertoire, uh, and the context uh, in which the recordings um, he's on were made. So we'll begin um, by looking at the context, uh, and Julian Futter's kindly uh, joining us today to talk to us about how the Chekhov's band album came about, uh, and also he's going to share with us some some recordings, the unheard recordings of Chitin Schneider, which is pretty exciting. Um, lastly, uh, then we'll look at some of Chitin Schneider's ornamentation and style, um, breaking down the, some of the different things that he, he does. Um, and then lastly, uh, I want to have a discussion about like about Tittenschneider and how how he fits in to the tradition, um, uh, and what we can conclude or from from learn from these recordings. Um, so originally, I learned this music uh, when I was at SOAS, uh, University of London, uh, doing a performances research recital. So I did a recital in Tittenschneider. Uh, to his repertoire. Um, so it's really nice to come back to it and to try and get other people interested if they're not already interested or just discuss it with other people who are interested. Um, okay, so context. When and where? Uh, the recordings were made uh, in Odessa in 1912. Um, at this time, Odessa was a massive regional centre uh, known as the southern capital of the Russian Empire. So it was a pretty massive place. Um, back in 1819, it was made a free port, which it was part of the Russian Empire, but this this gave it more, um, like it had a different status. And for that reason, it was a bit more lenient for minorities to live there. Um, uh, and it became a melting pot of Russians, French, Armenians, Poles, Greeks, Moldovans, and Jews by Titten Schneider's time. Um, through uh, the, the time that Chin Schneider was recorded in Odessa and onwards to the World World War II, um, the Jewish population in Odessa grew massively and it became known as uh, the Gate to Zion. So uh, many people emigrated from there to present day Israel or Old Palestine, um, especially between well between the World Wars. Um, so obviously the Zionist movement uh, was begun. Uh, in 1897 by Theodore Herzl. Uh, so by 1912, when this was recorded, it's highly possible that there was already a strong Zionist movement in Odessa itself. And it's interesting to think about whether Titten Schneider was involved in this at all. Um, interestingly, one of the songs that was recorded of him is called Remembrance of Zion. So, I mean, that's an interesting title. Um, however you look at it, really. Um, but it's, yeah, it's interesting that he was around at the same time as that happening. Um, okay, who made them and why? So they were recorded for a, an early record label called Gramophone um, by Edmund J. Pierce. Um, at the time, the label was sending re recording engineers around around, around Europe, uh, and, and uh, Edmund J. Pierce was mostly operating in the Russian Empire and Eastern Europe and recording examples of different traditional music from different ethnic groups. Um, and in terms of why they were doing this, um, Gramophone was set up by William Barry Owen for Emil Berliner, so in his place in the UK. So I guess, you know, they wanted to promote the use of the gramophone and the gramophone record. Um, like obviously, recordings have become such a massive part of uh entertainment in, in in you know uh over the last hundred years and um so recording different ethnic groups and different music from different places was probably they were trying to sell this exoticism to people who wouldn't have experienced much of it at this time because they're much more isolated back then um okay so who was Tittenschneider? so Tittenschneider literally translates as tobacco cutter um it's interesting, like a lot of names do, uh, second names can be 
the job that you have. Like uh, in English, for example, shearer, someone who shears maybe a sheep, or or ta- you know, or Schneider as a tailor, for example. Um, but to me, Tintin Schneider sounds more like a nickname than maybe his full name. It's really hard to know, though. We don't know. Um, it, apparently, his name suggests that he could have a Romanian Jewish background. Um, but there's no, we don't know. It's just uh, guesswork, really. Um, musical background. So, uh, given Tintin Schneider's like, virtuosic playing, it's, it seems like he was probably pretty educated musician like he'd been educated somewhere you would think in a music college uh but it's possible that he was from a musical family um obviously a lot of klezmerim came from these kind of families that uh they were all musicians um uh, and it's also possible that he could have been in the russian army and that's maybe where he learned to read um, i think he le- could read because of uh playing especially put as nigan which is through composed uh so it doesn't repeat it just goes right through it's a really extended piece of music um, um, if you haven't listened to that one, this is a really, a really interesting piece of music. Um, so why this repertoire? So it seems to me that, uh, Tintin Schneider saw this recording session as a chance to showcase his talents. Uh, all of the recordings, he is the soloist, the band don't play any of the melodies. It's just all about him. And I think, um, the record label probably had this idea as well. Um, so it, yeah, it seems to me that, that it was, it was focused on him. So he chose pieces that were soloistic. Um, the, for example, uh, Ukrainian fantasy, um, is very, very, very much, well, it's a theme and variations structure. So, uh, kind of classical soloists, this is a very common form of the time. Uh, Josh Horowitz was talking about, uh, Gusikov, um, uh, who's a bit earlier than Tintin Schneider, but uh, played xylophone, basically. Um, and he would have played theme and variations, a lot of theme and variations pieces. Peduzza also uh, would have done that kind of thing. So there's a lot of these, it's kind of um, uh, quite a few soloists at this time, uh, Klezmerim, who were like the, the better Klezmerim, who would have been playing more classical forms and maybe aspiring to be um, playing for Western classical audiences like Gusakov did. Um, yeah, interestingly, um, also uh, a remembrance of Zion, uh, the two pieces that he plays in that, he plays a, a Jewish taxim uh, and he plays a Scotchner, both for display pieces. So they sew off his talents. Um, in terms of the titles of the tunes, um, it's interesting they call Flora Romanian Jock. They, they label it by the the dance style of where it's originally from and i wonder if that was the record label um wanting to say well this is a romanian thing uh for audiences um i think that's probably more likely than tit and schneider calling it romanian jock well he probably just played something i would think um spring bulgarian dance is again they've labeled they really like they're trying to place it for people for the for, for the listener i guess um uh, also, obviously, that's being like an early stage of Bolgar before Bolgar, the Bolgar was fully developed. Um, Bolgarsko popery literally means um, a selection of Bulgarian melodies. So, for that tune, you can really tell they're fit. Some, some of the some of the sections have got odd numbers of bars, and it's it's really um, a group of different melodies. They're very much different melodies. Um, and whether they go well together or not is, is you know, up to your opinion, I guess. Um, so there's, there's a bunch of repertoire there. There's not particularly, you know, we're, we're told that they're not Jewish in a way, like the, the in terms of the labelling. Um, but obviously the way that Titten Schneider ornaments and the, his style is, is very Jewish. Um, but then there's other songs. So you've got Remembrance of Zion, which is, I mean, it's a, it seems like a bit of a statement of identity uh, to me. Um, and possibly, um, well, obviously there's some insight into what was Titten Schneider, what his political leaning, leanings, we don't know, but it's, it's quite interesting. Um, and then obviously Pudutzer's Niggen, named after Pudutzer, the famous, uh, violinist composer. Um, uh, so yeah, 
Um, so who what who were his backing band? Um, so it's interesting. Um, there's written evidence that Tin Schneider had played with the Carapets Oriental Orchestra, which was also in uh, Odessa at this time. And there's a recording uh, that Il- Ilya Sneves sent me actually um, of the Carabats Orchestra playing. And there's a clarinet player in there somewhere. It's not the focus of the music though. The focus of the music is a violin player. Um, uh, and it, to me, I, the instrumentation is also different from the from the from the uh, Titten Schneider recordings. I think the Carabats Oriental Orchestra is not playing. I don't think they're the people playing with Titten Schneider on 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 the recordings from Jekyll's band. I think that's a scratch band. Um, but yeah, let's compare the two bands. Let's listen to, to one and then listen to the other. So I'll just share screen. Um, or share sound. So this is Carapet's Romanian Orchestra, uh, Oriental Orchestra, so. as well so so on the on the Titten Schneider recordings from Jekyll's band there's no piano um there's fiddle and brass apart from Titten Schneider I think um oops how's I'm gonna read this um where's try again oh in fact I'll just share screen again um Okay, so I'm just going to share now Bogosco to compare it. Um, let's share screen. Ah, here we are. So if you hear there, like the band doesn't change, they change section to clearly the major and and uh, the band takes a while to change. It doesn't change straight away. And this is common on a lot of the recordings. So it sounds to me like the the band back in Titch Schneider on the Chekhov's band album that we have, those recordings, I, it, it sounds like they weren't, re- they were very poorly rehearsed or not rehearsed very much. Um, whereas the Carapets Orchestra listen to them, they're they're very well rehearsed, and I'm not even sure that um, Tintinelli was necessarily a, a regular member of the Carapets Orchestra. Um, he could have just been a soloist who came and played with them sometimes, um, because he's not featured in these other recordings. Just navigate back. Okay, so what's next? Okay, so next is to consider. How is this different or the same uh, as other klezmer source material that we have? Um, the most obvious comparable source is Belf, I think. Um, so Belf was recorded in around 1910, also pre-war, pre-First World War, Eastern Europe. Um, other sources, uh, for example, Majid is, a, is, a, is later, the 20s and 30s. Berogovsky is also later, and obviously Brandwein and Taras are both in America and later as well. Uh, so Belf is probably the, the clearest comparison. Now, interestingly, um, I think it's quite different to Belf, the style of recordings. Belf is a lot more of an ensemble. Um, they obviously played together 
like they know the same repertoire. Um, whereas for me, the Tinchado is much more soloistic. He, um, Tinchado really, you know, it's all about him. Um, so, um, maybe we should listen to some Tin Schneider if, well, I don't know. In fact, we've not got loads of time. Should we listen to some? Yeah. Okay. So let's listen to some more Tin Schneider, uh, to maybe just show how soloistic what, what he's, what, what he was doing was in case anyone, anyone hasn't, isn't familiar with it. Um, okay. So share screen. Okay, this is Remembrance of Zion. So this first piece is like a, a Fragish, um, a Taksim sort of thing. Um, it's obviously very soloistic with Tinshaw as the focus. And then later in this recording, uh, we get to a Scotchna, which is a display piece. So it's a bit like a Freilich, but it's not really for dance music. It's for showing off. Um, so I'll just fast forward to that. So yeah, if you compare it to Belf, I think, you know, Belf, they're playing the melody together, different instruments like violin, clarinet, um, and it, it's quite different for me. Um, so next, we're going to have, uh, we're really lucky to have uh, Julian Futter who, from uh, Rene Records, who's going to say a bit about how the Chekhov's Band album uh, came about, and also to introduce for us some repertoire um that's unheard to Tim Schneider. So um, really exciting. Uh, thanks for joining us, Julian. Hi. Uh, yeah, so how did the Chekhov's Band CD come about? I'd been working on producing CDs of Jewish music for about 20 years, and I'd already remastered and re released some vintage recordings from Baghdad in the 1920s, Bombay in the 1930s, then I met Michael Aylward, who at that stage was working on a discography of recordings made in, well, all Jewish recordings made in, in Europe prior to the Second World War, but in particular, working on recordings made in Lemberg for the Yiddish theater in the years just before the First World War. And in conversation with him, we sort of decided that it would be a good idea to bring his discographic work, bring it to life by issuing some of these recordings on a CD with substantial notes and illustrations, which something we did and we called it Wandering Stars. And while we were doing this and listening to some of the tracks, we were listening into particular, there's one track with a a flourishing solo by a violinist called Oscar Zengut. And I was saying to think, you know, this is great um, klezmer fiddle playing. And he said that really there's a killer CD to be made of klezmer recordings from the EMI archives, which was then, or is still today in, in Hayes, just, out, just outside of London. The only problem being that at that stage, nobody could get any access to this material. And he'd been in Hayes before and spent months going through catalogs and recording engineers, log books, but he hadn't had a chance to actually sit down and, and listen to all this material. And we tried initially without any success, but as luck would have it, EMI was just being taken over by Warner Brothers and Universal. And I happen to know the commercial director of classical and jazz at Universal. 
and therefore we managed to get an introduction to at least get into the archive. And we got into the archive and we listened to a fair amount of material, but uh, not as much as we would have liked because again, the costs of actually just getting the material out and listening to it was, was very high. But eventually we decided on a, a list of recordings that we felt would be worth releasing. And after about a year of negotiations, I managed to get the rights to reissue the 78s. And I think we did this by the skin of our teeth because just after that event, the instructions were given that on no account would any further access be given to the release of this type of material for commercial purposes. Uh, I was also lucky at the time as well that my distributors, Honest John, had a, a good network and were able to give the records good, uh, a wide, as wide a distribution as possible. Um, yeah, we had a long list of material that we wanted to hear, but in the end, we, we narrowed it down to about 35 items. Um, some items sadly no longer existed. For example, the, there were two Tittenschneider sides recorded in September 1912 with Karapetz Orchestra. One of which actually was really interesting because that was a, a Greek piece. I'm not sure, we don't know what it was because it's just a Greek piece on the title, but that might have tied in nicely with the talk we had the other week about the link between Rembetica or Greek music and, and uh, Glesmer music. Um, but more galling than that actually were 30 Belf recordings that were made in Warsaw in March 1914. And it appears that the First World War intervened before they got a chance to send the material back to be archived in Hayes. And there seems to be no trace of this material at all, but that would really, that would have been another, another CD in itself. But sadly, I think that material has been lost. Um, yeah, so the Tittenschneider, we, we really, we, well, we managed to get copies of, apart from these two recordings he made with Karapet in Kharkov, about nine months later, we, we got all the Tittenschneider sides. The two that we left out, were left out because I didn't really want to fill the CD just with Tittenschneider material. There was a lot of other material that we wanted to put on. And the Doina, which I think you're gonna play in a minute, John, which is a great, a beautiful, beautiful piece. The only reason we didn't put that in was because we had Shevlev, the other clarinetist, um, performing a Doina on the CD as well. So we thought we'd leave the Doina to Shevlev at the time. Um, and that's really how the, that was the genesis of the, the CD and why we brought it out. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a terrific project, took a lot of time and uh, we've, we're all very proud of it. With good reason, thanks, Julia. Cool, yeah, great to hear about that. Um, John here as well, who I think worked, you worked with on the project. Yes, very much so. I mean, he was responsible pretty much for all the notes on the, the CD. Great, thanks, Julian. Um, so I guess let's hear this unreleased um, material. So I'll just share screen with everyone. Um, so first off, we've got a Doina by Tim Schneider.
so yeah wow um um yeah it's really i mean it's really a lovely joiner and then uh the piece afterwards i really it's quite funny to listen to the band and their accompaniment because i i'm pretty sure they didn't know what tune he was going to come in with <laughs> it's kind of just like <laughs> change the chord once he's come in um but yeah really nice to hear and I, I guess they finished maybe before the end of that tune because of the length of the cylinder or you know they could, it wouldn't record it any longer i guess um so the other tune that we have is a komaranska or komaranskaya which is like a, a russian dance um uh interestingly that kind of repertoire with uh national dances and stuff um gusikov also would have played this kind of same kind of things and um i think it's quite a common i mean i guess they would have played the different musics of the, the people near where they lived and there were definitely russians in odessa so um so let's hear that uh. So yeah, I mean, it's oh, whoops. So there's yeah, so much personality in that in that one. It's like, yeah, it's like a cartoon towards the end. You know, it's amazing. Um, all right. So um, I thought what we do next is to look at some examples of um, different ornamentation or ornaments and style things that Tinchnaya does. Um, so let me just bring this up. Okay, so one one thing that Titten Schneider does a lot, and oh, this is in fact this is probably a good time. Um, so, uh, yeah, so if you if you if you download your charts and you want to play along with some of these things to work and to learn some of these uh, these these stylistic things, um, now would be a good time to get the charts out. 
Um, in terms of keys, we will do. We will be looking at um, Flora in uh, concert G minor, um, Spring uh, concert G major. It's all the same keys as the recordings. Uh, Zion in concert E minor, and Bolgasco in concert D minor. Um, just there may be a little bit of confusion because some of the charts say B flat clarinet on them, but they're actually concert charts. Um, so just in case anyone's confused. Uh, all right. So uh, in terms of stylistic stuff. Um, so one thing that I noticed that um, Tinchai does a lot is uses pedal notes. Um, not well, pedal notes and also pedal crests, like crest using a, a note that they're correcting to he's correcting he's making a correct to uh it's like a pedal note so in terms of just uh uh pedal notes first uh, a good place to start is maybe flora um the a and b sections of flora so in the first section of uh flora are you gonna do you, you, know, you want to share the yeah oops okay uh, so yeah, in the first section of Flora, um, we have this. Um, but uh, Winter obviously Chen Shai plays it at the octave above, but he does a pedal note into that. So uh, so um, what he does is he just plays into each of these notes. He's pedal he's pedaling from the root. So, uh, um, so that's one one place that he does it. Um, obviously, feel free to play along and work out these some of the things. And also, if you don't get some of the things that I'm talking about, feel f we can look at you know if some just say. Because we can we can look and I can explain further. Um, okay, so the next time he uses this kind of thing is in the B section uh, of this piece, so from bar eighteen there. So, uh, but this is he, he's correcting, like doing a correct to the same place. Um, so obviously the melody is just. But he plays. Uh, So what he's doing is, um, if you're a clarinet player and you're playing a C clarinet, um, you've got obviously that B flat fingering. He's correcting up to uh, an open fingering. So, so from the A, he's just going like that, correcting up to that note. And he's coming from that that same uh, note that you corrected to back and forth for the melody. So one time slowly. So Okay, so that's another example of that. Um, and then apart from that, uh, we also have, uh, well, the in spring and the A section of spring is another really good place uh, where he uses pedal notes, uh, he corrects again in the same in a similar way. So he plays. Um, so in the first section of spring, uh, he's like. So he's again. It's the same place as before. Um, it's basically the fifth of, of the scale. So say we're in, we're in G major concert. So he's correcting to the, the D. Um, but he's on the clarinet, he's not fingering a D. It's, it's just an open fingering. Uh, so that's uh, another example of that. Um, so so yeah, pedal notes and pedal corrects happens a lot in his in the music that he's playing. Uh, a third example of it is uh, in the C section of Zion. Uh, Remembrance of Zion. Uh, so he plays. 
So how does that section go? Um, C plays. <laughs> So it's just, um, there's a loads of pedal notes in this music. Um, and I think that's evident on the other recording of the Commons Kaya as well. Um, so in the C section here, um, yeah, so it's in from bar 22, if you can see what I mean. So... So he's... He's, it's just a pedal point thing, and he's got the the D, and then he's obviously going down the major scale step by step, but coming back to the D, the octave above. Um, so that's another example of that. Uh, also, in the, there's a pedal thing going on. Also, you can see uh, bar from bar 27 in the last section there. So um, we've got the bar 27, 28, bar 29. We've got the. So that's another example of him uh, using uh, pedal points. Um, so another thing that he does a lot uh, is to use what I like to call consecutive crests. So um, he plays one crest and then another, um, or sometimes three in a row. So um, a good example of that is in the in the taxim. I haven't, there's no chart for this one, but the taxim at the start of Zion, remember of Zion, um, he. Uh, so this is in uh, E Fragish E concert. So E in concert E Fragish, um, and he he plays I think three cracks in a row in this first in one of the bits where it goes higher. So he goes. So if you just take the actual notes, it's just so E natural F G sharp, but he actually cracks. He goes. Um, so all in one phrase, uh, like immediately. So the other thing he does straight after that, actually, in that tune, is he he's cracking from E to A on the clarinet. Um, and then, well, he's just he's playing ba ba da, so, and then he cracks from that, but he goes just taking his thumb off, so it's quite a big interval. So, um, which is interesting as well. Um, so yeah, in terms of consecutive cracks, another place that's really obvious with that is the B section of spring. Um, so he combines m more than one, he combines quite a few. So, um, so that section, um, so if you look at bar 11, there you've got, and what he does is so every note he's going for, he cracks into. Um, so yeah, combining cracks. It's interesting as well. Um, I don't know if Zillion's here, but a tune that he taught me, a, a Naftali Randvine tune, Naftal does something similar on a Liebdig Naftal. Uh, so that's it's a is interesting to see the both those guys using the same kind of thing. Um, another really cool thing and I think it's quite a little bit more unique to Tintschneider for me is um, that he uses wide trills a lot of the time. Um, in that Comrades Kaya that we played, that unheard one, um, there's a lot of trills that are, are very wide, like a third, um, and often because of the physics of the clarinet I think what he's doing is, is uh, moving, he's like lifting a finger up instead of instead of trilling just like that he may be being doing that so he's got to say he's on an f sharp and he's just lifting that finger so if uh we look at the same uh the spring b section uh later in that same b section there's a good example of that um 
So we've got the bit we looked at already. But that's obviously just a tone trill there. Uh, so he, he, he manages to trill um, So he, what he does is he lifts a finger. So um, let me just do that slowly. So that's the one. So he he makes a wider trill, um, and it's just something that physically makes sense on the clarinet. Um, so it's an interesting one to try and translate into other instruments, but it's a lot wider and it gives much more like um, completely different sound uh, to the ornamentation. Um, or, and it, and it's, I think it's a big part of Titner Schneider's sound. Um, another place that he does stuff like this is in the, the last section of Bolgarsko. Um, so this is this kind of the section that gets, this has also got multiple, um, like combinations of uh, crests. Um, so at bar 33 here, so we've got uh, so that again is this, literally the same fingering. Um, so if you on the bar 34, um, you've got the let me think about this. Uh, So just yeah the last two quavers of bar 33 that's where he does that he's got the f sharp down and he raises the finger above so it gets like a third heart uh, trill so So he does that a lot, and, and and literally with the same, the same way around, the same fingering, um, which makes me wonder a little bit if he's left-handed because it's always on the left side. Um, although there's some other examples where he does a big uh, wider trill actually on the right side as well. Um, so the next, um, so yeah, so there's there's more examples of this, but maybe I'll go through all of them. Um, there's the. So yeah, another thing he does is the use of um, grace notes to kind of make the melody a bit more interesting. Um, so in Bolgarsko in the B section, um, he does this really obviously. So he, he uses grace notes to kind of make it more, I don't know, I would say spiky. So uh, in the B section, so we've got at bar 17. So we've got this... So, uh, I mean, that's he's fitting them in to make just makes the melody so much uh, more interesting. Um, so that's another place he does. That's the place he does that. Um, in spring, uh, on the A section, is a really obvious one. So, uh, so first, first of all, the first one being right at the start. Uh, so we've got ah. So Alana, that's that's the B flat part. Sorry, it's my fault. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so the first bit of uh, spring. So it's another another bit there with the. Uh, 
Um, so he like adding notes uh, to the basic melody as grace notes to to make it more interesting is he's something he does a lot. Um, he also does it in like the arpeggios in between things. So uh, on Flora, for example, um, the way he starts, he goes. Uh, oh, okay. uh, so he starts. He repeat, instead of going, he goes. Just makes it more jerky and more on edge. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's for Flora, and um, he also does it in Bolgarsky with arpeggios. But maybe that's enough examples of that one for a sec. Uh, another thing that he does is he uh, does some. He does these. Like with some of the high notes, he'll pick like pitch falls. So he just falls off the notes. So uh, in the C section of spring, um, he does this. This is something that I've always used to think is like not really klezmer. And like, because someone like Dave Tarras never does it, I don't really. Um, but falling off the notes, the, like high notes. So in the last section of spring, um, so he's like a. Uh, So those notes going do 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 do. I mean that's something that's like very um, almost comic. Uh, so just in the third bar of uh, so 21, 22, 23, 23 and twenty four, you can see that there. So um, so that's another thing that he does. Um, uh, in the C section of of Bulgarsko as well, he does this um, as one last example. Maybe that's enough examples. Um, so yeah, uh, at bar twenty seven. So with that that descending uh, dominant thing. So you've got bar twenty six. You've got the and you've got the. So, uh, so that's another example of the pitch falling thing. Um, he also uses a lot of push and pull. Uh, one piece that has loads of this is Zion, uh, the the Scotchner bit of Zion. So, um, like he hardly ever plays in this piece like evenly. It's always like dotted quavers with a semi-quaver or like a, a triplet quaver and then two triplet quavers. So it's it's always, it's, it's hardly ever uh, even. So, I mean, just from the start of the melody, you can, it's already written into the melody. I mean, uh, So that's yeah you can really hear it there um uh yeah and in terms of other things um uh zev feldman's uh zingen tansen Spreckendick uh idea um about so uh in jewish music in the melody uh sounding like it's sung sounding like it's uh spoken and sounding like for dance music um is something that's really evident also in uh, in in the Tichenheimer vocabulary, I think. Uh, so, in the B section of of Zion, which we're just looking at, that's it's a really good one for that, I think, because of um, the way he plays it. So, um, how's it go? So just with that first few phrases of the B section in Zion, um, so at bar nine. Uh, you've got a very singing start, but straight away he goes into. Which could be, it sounds kind of conversational. Uh, So 
whole time with that. So. So if you break that down, you've got that first bit that's um, which is very much zing and dick, so singing. Um, and then you've got the so, and you've got the which could be speck and dick, so talking. Um, and then maybe it, well, it starts off more like talking or, or dancing, and then goes back to uh, singing with that last bit um, and then obviously in the last so bar 13 uh, the last four bars of that section uh, it finishes very much uh, in a dancey way with the doublet feel um, cool so I, I wasn't really sure how much of a workshop this was going to be or how much of a more of a talk um, so the next thing that I was thinking of doing, if you want to do, was to maybe just to teach the first few phrases of the Zion taxim. Um, uh, it's not written down, but if, if people wanted to learn that, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea or if, if we're running out of time and we should get to discussion. Um, what do you think, Ilana? Uh, I don't know. We could take a vote. We could have everybody putting up their little virtual hands if they want to yeah, what do people think? learn a bit of the tune. Anybody want to unmute themselves and just or vote it's a democracy guys look i've never seen everybody so quiet <laughs> when, when do have to, what time do you have to finish it on well you know how long's a piece of string john when does everybody have to go to bed in in europe maybe we could take it stop and take some questions and then if people have to kind of sure. don't want to do the learning bit and you know let's stop for some questions and comments and thoughts and then we'll we'll move on to that so anybody have any questions comments or thoughts Really? Okay, no questions. I have some questions for everyone here, though. Oh. Um, <laughs> so maybe I can ask these questions. Um, so, so I had a, I mean, there's, I just had a few things I was thinking about um, with this repertoire. Um, so obviously, this these recordings are pretty um, special because, uh, unlike a lot of other traditions that have a continuous like, unbroken line of of generation teaching the next generation obviously klezmer's got a different situation um and there's not so much source material from before world war, world war one um so obviously this is a really important source to have um but i i just wonder what people think about where Schneider fits in uh to the tradition um like i don't really know of any modern uh klezmer clarinet players who do who really play like him i guess the source is, he's only his music's only been discovered recently so i just wondered how will people feel about where he fits in if anyone's got anything to say about what they think of tittenschneider's style whether they like it whether they don't like it etc sherry's unmuted sherry have you got a comment or well i don't know i mean i i haven't I, I would need to listen a lot more than i have i mean i think he definitely fits into the spectrum of playing uh towards the belt end of things um Personally, I don't like the grace note part so much, but I love what he does with note bending. And, um, you know, I think he's a very expressive player. So I like the expressive end of his things rather than the more virtuosic stuff, but that's mm -hmm. just me. Um, uh, since I have the floor, can I ask my questions? Um, these are all like access questions. First of all, um, so I, I understand from, if I understood Julian correctly, he only recorded a total of nine sides that we know of, except for those two that seem to have disappeared. Is that correct? Um, I think there's either nine or ten. I can't remember which. Yeah, yeah, and two which we haven't, we, we couldn't find in the archive. And are the two that that um, John played that uh, are, are they available somewhere that one could get access to them? No, no, but I can send you an MP3 if you if you want. That. I would love that if you wouldn't mind. And, yeah, yeah. And, and finally, um, it, with respect to the EMI archives, what's what's their deal? I mean, are people, it was the same thing with Sony. It's like, um, are people really afraid that someone's gonna make money on this stuff? <laughs> I, 
I can say a little bit about that. Um, actually, I think their policy has changed because um, the Jewish Music Research Center at the uh, National Library in, in Jerusalem uh, has just released a very extensive set of CDs of Sephardic recordings from the EMI archives, which they got permission to do. So this seems, it seems to be on a case by case basis. I don't think they're afraid that people are going to make money off it. I mean, who buys CDs anymore, right? But, um, but that has been they're 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 worried about who knows what copyright issues, I don't know. The, the National Library has been very reluctant to post stuff because of copyright issues. Yeah. I, I don't think there were copyright issues that were yeah. the problem at the time, especially in Britain. The copyright has, has long, we haven't got a situation like you have in America. It's, it's very different. I think it was actually the commercial, somebody making a decision about the commercial exploitation of the archive. And I think they were too worried that this album would become a, a roaring success and EMI would lose out. You know, it, it, <laughs> what can it's I say? Absurd. It's absurd. But yeah. it was, I mean, it was, ex it was an expensive operation. It was, there was absolutely no way that one could make money out of this deal in the yeah. end, not after their charges. And they wanted to charge me a lot more. And I told them actually that if you're going to want what you really originally asked for, then the whole thing is dead. I mean, I'm not prepared. I don't mind putting money into it because I made money out of the previous issues and I put that money back into this. But beyond that, I'm not a charity. I'm not doing this for, for, for fun. I'm doing it for fun, but not I'm not paying for it. <laughs> do they give access to scholars? They do, but I don't. But, but as I remember the stipulation, because there's a, a number like Paul, I don't know if you know Paul Vernon, he's another um re discographer who's done a lot of research at hayes um the stipulation was that if you wanted to get transfers if you wanted to hear the stuff you had to get transfers made and they had to be done at the abbey road studios and it was very expensive by their technicians basically although i i think they they changed that recently or they were talking about changing it that because they have the equipment there on site to listen to this material we we actually we were listening to it on site, although they weren't supposed to be playing it to us. But of course, any transfers, anything I wanted to take back with me and, and work on, we had to pay the full costs for all that at Abbey Road. Hmm. Interesting. But it was a great project. <laughs> it it was, was, it was super fun to work on. And actually it was originally gonna be two CDs but we realized that would be an overkill, I guess. Yeah, it was It was the expense actually that yeah. killed it. Yeah. How much I mean, more the, inter how? the interesting thing is that the guys at Honest John's wanted to release it again as a, a vinyl. Hmm. <laughs> but but how again- much the more, how, Sorry, go ahead. No, carry on, carry on. How much more material was there in terms of the, um, that they had, uh, Klezmer, instrumental stuff. There was a fair amount of instrumental material. How much of it you'd classify as Klezmer? I don't know. There's a lot of material by a band in Vilnia called, uh, conducted by a guy called Stupel. Yeah. And quite a lot of it, for me anyway, and for a number of people I know, it, it's quite boring stuff. It's sort of theater material and it does, mm -hmm. it does, outstay its welcome, but the, the <laughs> amount of material available by the likes of people like Tittenschneider or, or Zemgut or these guys is, is very limited, very limited. Indeed. Yeah, yeah, just to put it in context, and it's a shame that Mike's not here actually, but... Um, I invited him, but... Yeah, you know. yeah, I think he hasn't been feeling well, but, um, I, you know, Mike's been working on this discography since, well, we met in the early 90s and he was already working on it. So he's been working on it for about 30 years and he's documented the existence of somewhere upwards of 15,078 recordings of Jewish material in, in Europe in the 78 format. Um, but of those, I think we figured out, we, we did a calculation. I think it was like at the most, maybe four or five hundred of those were were instrumental tunes. 
Interesting. And and of those, as Julian mentioned, so Stupel was a you know that was the one of the main klezmer families in in Vilna and in some of the other parts of Lithuania, but. But um, of course, they were playing theater arrangements, and it's it suffers some of the same flaws, I guess, as you might say, of this Russian Jewish or of this unnamed Russian Jewish right. orchestra uh, that was uh, released the number of sides on I don't know if it was gramophone, I forgot the label, but they um, favorite, I think, but uh, they were also from Vilna, as far as I've been able to figure out. So it seems to have been a local. Style. Oh, well, just the Yiddish theater thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we got the best out of EMI. I think what, yeah. what we brought out is, is really the, the cream of the crop. Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry. And so I meant to say, but so of those four or 500 pieces, of course, they're not all at the, they're not all from the gramophone and zonophone right. legacy. So they're not going to be at the archive, but, um, you know, obviously, like Julian was saying, there are big holes like the Belf recordings just disappeared. And those are not the same. Those are, I think, not the Serena Belfs. These are other ones that no, we have not that are, heard. The 30 that are missing are gramophone. Are gramophone. Yeah, they, that's right. They're yeah. not the ones that were recorded. They were, I mean, some of the titles are the same as the Serena ones, but right. they're different, record, different recordings entirely. And probably right. knowing EMI or eight, at, HMV at the time, gramophone, the quality would probably be a lot better than the Serena recording. Hmm. Cool. Um, that's really interesting. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Is anyone dying to us? I mean, this is really the point where if we want to have a discussion or, or think about, I mean, it's just like the floor is open, really, if people want to say something or ask a question. If not, I'll have to just keep on trying to ask questions that might inspire you to ask a question. Well, I'll just I'll, I'll sort of stick my neck out and talk a little bit about you asked about where he fits in to the more general picture. I mean, this is something that I've been working on for a while. And actually, I wrote an article for this anthology that that um, Alan Byrne and Diane Diana Matut are working on um, about Bel the various Belf and, and fake Belf recordings and so forth. I talk not so much about Titun Schneider, but I think he, um, it certainly is, there's a spectrum. And to me, he seems like uh, the, both the missing link between the Belf, which is less virtuosic and more kind of folksy for lack of a <laughs> better technical term um and the more modern style uh as represented by say Schlumpke Beckerman and Naftola Branwein and then the even more modern style that Dave Ter Terrace developed so it sort of exists on a continuum and um you know unfortunately we have so few examples of these tit Titun Schneider is an exception because we've actually got these eight or ten recordings by him but um, many of them, like these blank labels that Jerry, you know the whole story about that, 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 that Kurt Bierling uh, dug up, um, you know, we don't even know the names of the musicians. And in some cases, there's only one recording by a particular mm -hmm. clarinetist, uh, this, this uh, Jacques Fantasy, for example. Yeah. We don't know who it was. We, it's like, is it a one-off? We don't know how to fit it in. And so at least with Titun Schneider, we can see, okay, he's doing similar repertoire to Branwine. It's similar repertoire to Belf. And yet it's got, you know, distinct um, sort of stylistic connections to both Branwine and Terrace and to Beckerman and so forth. So, so we start seeing more of a kind of a stylistic arc where they're all, they all fit under the, the umbrella somehow, stylistically. I think there's no question that he was a klezmer. Uh, we don't know anything about his family or the name or, or anything. I think one of the really interesting things about his style is his use of the low register, which is not something that you hear a lot, except uh, later on some Dave Terrace. But, you know, it's, it's not a register that's um, embraced very much by most of the Klesmorum. And I found that quite fascinating. Because he manages to be very expressive in it. 
yeah, it's it's harder to hear a lot of that when he is lower, isn't it, on his recordings? Um, which is a pity. But I mean, like on Craculets, I think for example, it's really quite hard, very difficult to hear. Um, but yeah, okay, that's yeah, an interesting yeah. So it kind of fills in a, a side that we don't know. Well, yeah, fills in the side of of what came before a little bit for us, which is great. Um, I want I wondered if people thought that like obviously the quality of, of the recordings. Uh, is okay uh but the unrehearsed band i wonder if that was something that people people felt uh put off um you know put off people from learning this music or uh being interested in it because obviously chitin schneider's playing is fascinating if you're a clarinet player and you listen to that and you like klezmer you're probably going to be interested in it but for other uh people interested in klezmer you know is that going to put you off um and is you know should we be aiming to like do our own versions of this music to get it played more common, like more commonly at jam sessions, things like that. Is that something people, is that something people think we should be doing? Um, anyone got any opinions on that? I mean, because if, if no one plays it, it's going to be lost, isn't it? I don't think anybody has objections to people playing tunes at jam sessions, do they? It's just no, how many yeah. people know it and how virtuosic it is, how suitable it is for an actual jam session, I suppose. Yeah, well, some of the chin size repertoire is more, much easier, isn't it? I mean, like Spring and Flora, for example, are doable for you know for for a jam session. Um, well, I don't know. I taught I taught these tunes to all my students, and uh, we played them. And uh, yeah, I cha I I reharmonized some of them. I mean, it is, you know, I I do think that the band that was backing him up, whether it was Carp, I don't, you know, probably wasn't the same ensemble that you as you mentioned the Carpet. The other recordings are kind of Russian, much more sophisticated arrangements. But they didn't know. I think not only were they not rehearsed, I think they weren't klezmer musicians. They didn't know the style. They didn't even know the harmonizations for Fragish. So they were just. <laughs> I think you have to you have to use a bit of imagination to 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 create an ensemble sound for for these recordings or for this repertoire. The band that supported Tittenschneider was probably the what was called the Jewish Wedding Band. They were the band that were in the studio in Odessa during the weeks that, or the days that Pierce was recording. It, it would be unlikely that he would have got two bands in to, to record at that stage. Oh, so that's really, so you think it was Bach's orchestra, the one, the... the... I think it was Bach's orchestra. Wow. Yeah. Be I think it makes sense. It makes sense. But they're much more, uh, but those guys are klezmer musicians and they're much more yeah. familiar with that style. So I'm surprised... Yeah that they didn't that they acted like they didn't know what was coming next <laughs> I, know. I just think they don't care i mean i just did a two-part presentation on this i mean mm -hmm. I, I i really believe that that it it didn't matter it's like it's like on some level what isn't melody is percussion and it doesn't matter so much about the chords we're all focused on chords and i don't think they cared i really don't yeah. that's interesting it's like bass being um seen as a percussion instrument in the old days you know um just slap it as hard as possible and it's more about the rhythm um yeah it's really interesting and i guess also point. how do they perceive the recording you know being recorded did they even know who was like how many people would listen to it um they might have just been like they might not really have known what was going on um as in like the significance of it in in the future they, they probably mm. wouldn't have any idea would they i think it was just a gig because they would have been paid for that one session, a certain amount, and that's it. There was no question of royalties in those days. So it was it was a gig. They were paid and they they performed a bit like, I mean, take us another example for, I don't know if you know, there was a, a cellist called Emmanuel Feuermann made a recording in London of the Haydn Cello Concerto and a EMI or Columbia, I can't remember who it was, it doesn't matter, basically got a scratch orchestra together. It was a dis fairly disastrous session because nobody had done much rehearsal, but it worked, you know, the, it managed, Feuermann plays magnificently, the orchestra doesn't, but hey, it worked. And maybe it's the same thing here. We got an orchestra, guys, come on, play. Well, and does it also imply that the tunes he was playing weren't particularly popular? They didn't know them. They had no idea what was coming next and they were just kind of guessing as they went along. Maybe. Yeah. 
But it's not too... <laughs> I mean, if he's in D and if he's playing in D minor, it's not too much of a stretch to expect that the next section is going to either be in D or F major, or if he's in, you know, Fragish <laughs> in D Fragish, that the next section might be in C minor or something. I mean, from your mouth to God's ear, Gerald. You yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> Craig's being very vocal on the uh, on the yeah. chat. I, maybe you want to actually just unmute and say something, Craig. Hazarding a guess here, or are you quite happy just? Sure. Happy? <laughs> yes, um, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's really interesting about the Jewish wedding orchestra thing. The, the, the box to me, like, yeah, that makes sense. With like I said, like that six oh six piece has like some similarities in the feel. It's different. It's more theatrical or something for me, but um, but again, has these like really off off beats. Um, uh what was my last thought oh i don't know yeah i mean in some of those things like in the doina like it does go to some kind of weird places and the band is right there so at least there it seems to me like they know the tune and maybe he just told them before like the list of notes he's going to uh but it feels like they know that one yeah yeah you can definitely was... hear they know some of it don't they so go on but I was going to say we were just uh, on the uh, what is it the Ber the Berigovsky forum. There's been a discussion today about these four new new sides by the by Box Orchestra that that have surfaced on RussianRecords.com and and um, you know they're they're also like you were saying they also have this offbeat thing going and stuff. But they're it's but they're more sophisticated somehow. I, it's hard for me to imagine that it's the same musicians, but. Who knows? Yeah, I mean, unless they knew that he likes that style or like that's just an older style that they're like, okay, we're doing this thing now. And like, yeah. we all know what this thing is. But then now we're playing with like the film now. Yeah. I mean, to me, I don't know. Personally, I don't find there to be anything wrong with like the way that they change chords. Like, I know it's not sort of like right on the beat, but sort of like, um, like Sherry was talking about and like she just went on her lecture, but just like, yeah, sort of this thing of like the chords change after the melody and not really that you're playing the chords to this beat and this part of the tune or whatever it's like you're just providing the rhythmic foundation and some yeah but it, but isn't that really more the case on the rubato mater material dance tunes you know the the chords usually change on the beat especially at the beginning of a measure yeah i guess when i think about some of like the i don't know it's like some of the other non-jewish stuff from like parts on there where like chords don't really exist uh or like, I don't know, like just the whole way they're playing chords. Like they're not, they're not, you know, they don't go to the five chord at the end of the phrase and stuff. Like it's just sort of just modal things. Yeah, I don't know. It's, just, it's, a, it's a different world, but it, it doesn't feel wrong to me. I can hear what you're saying. Um, yeah, I know it's hard to know what was normal for them, isn't it? It's hard to know. Uh, although I guess you can compare recordings at the same uh, made at a similar time that's the, the only way to know but if you don't know who the band is and where they were from or or what what music they normally played it's really difficult to know what was well, normal you, for them if you look at the Belf orchestra which is you know our best example because we've got so much material of theirs available there are ones where they change chords in a pretty sophisticated way and they they do it correctly you know as we would um, today and there are others where they don't and you know I mean I, I, I can only deduce from this that um, there were times when it felt like it mattered and then there were times like it doesn't and then then you've got the uh, Tantra Binu which is the one where they don't change the chord at all and they do all of their interesting stuff with rhythm which I think with, that wasn't because they didn't know how to change chords it was because I think they were making an aesthetic choice to take the focus off of the harmony piece and put it on the rhythm piece. I don't know. Could I ask something about tuning? I mean, it was it, you mentioned that you thought he might have been older, John, at one point. And his, I mean, was it him that wasn't in tune or the back? I mean, I'm assuming that tuning was more of a thing than chord changing, even in those days, to some extent, that you wanted to be in roughly the same pitch uh, ball. Well, I mean, this That's is before we standardized tuning, of, I would think, right? So. No, you but know, when he, they... was, he was playing, uh, you know, he was sharp or flat or with the orchestra and they were in the same pitch and he was in a different pitch. And then gradually they came together during the, in some of those tunes that we were listening to earlier. 
Yeah, I mean, it's. I mean, I guess you know, if you're a clarinet player and you're, I, we don't know where they recorded the temperature. We don't know many things. Um, uh, for example, you know, if you're a clarinet player and you're not warmed up and you start playing, and it's cold, you're probably going to be a bit flat. So, and as you get going, you get sharper. And um, it's really hard to know. Um, in my opinion, yeah. Um, yeah. But I think it is fair to say, I mean, Titun Schneider had sort of, let's say, classical aspirations in the sense of, you know, like these introductions that to, to some of the tunes are kind of operatic or operetta-ish in their kind of flourishes and things like that. But he's not a symphonic player. He doesn't have a symphonic sound. He doesn't have symphonic technique, as opposed to Shevelev, who's on the same recording who's a much cleaner, much more precise player who clearly had symphonic training and probably played in a symphony or something like that. And there's, you know, that's a whole nother range um, as well. Now, I don't think any, not too many of the Klezmer clarinetists that we've heard recordings of had symphonic um, chops. I'm trying to think of somebody. Harry Beckerman, maybe. Uh, also like it seems like isn't this a bit more of a soloist and band setup than anything else like compared to belt like yeah they're always like the fiddle playing something like the melody you know and it's really there's some kind of interaction like here it's very much the melody up front and then the band behind them so, yeah. you know it's like well i think there has been speculation and i know that that jeff wallach is working on another article about this um that uh that the Belf band, you know, it's a very unusual combination of instruments, or it's a very unusual size. And the speculation is that it's probably a subset of a larger group, first of all. And secondly, um, that it may not have been the whole band, that it may have just been Belf and the violinist, or maybe they were both Belf, who knows, um, both Belf family, playing with a pickup band, basically. Huh. And that's why you get these weird discrepancies because they're those the the pianist and the second violinist uh, were maybe not even familiar with their playing. Interesting. But we don't know. Hmm. Uh, for any just for what it's worth, I, I post about this also somewhere online. But um, the the Peduzzer's Niggin or whatever that he plays, it is a version of number 254 or whatever the Luli Vigla did the back of Baragowski. So you can look there and see, compare what he's doing to what's in the manuscript, which is interesting. You know, he cuts out most of the opening a little bit. Um, and also I think it's, yeah, it's an interesting way to think about how to work with some of those manuscripts. And it shows us that, yeah, like this guy, he knew Pedroza and I mean, he knew the, the music. But to me, just back up the idea of him being a klezmer as if that needed to be backed up. Cool. I didn't know it was in uh, the Berogovsky. That's really interesting. Um, I, mean, I guess that's a bit later. Um, but I get. I mean, I was reading uh, Zev's book, the new one, and he was saying about um, that often compose. You know, they'd write down uh, pieces of, of famous musicians and usually play it after they'd passed. They wouldn't play it before, apparently. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, so I guess it would have been passed down, um, and that would have been a significantly later when Berogovsky would have recorded that, I guess, right? Um, uh, yeah, well, I think he gets it from the manuscript in Makhnovetsky, right? Oh, okay. Um, so then it was maybe recorded at a different time. Um, right. Interesting. I don't think it was recorded at all. I think it was a manuscript as part of the... Yeah. the... No, that's that's what I mean, but it, it would have... Yeah. The, um, oh, I see. So it could have been written down earlier, much earlier, I guess. Um Cool. Um, uh, I mean, it's, this has been really uh, interesting and to hear everyone's opinions and stuff and, and to geek out about Titten Schneider. Um, I mean, I, anyone who wants to say something or has an opinion, please say something, even if you don't know much about it, because I, I don't want this to be like an exclusive thing. I, I, it'd be nice to, to promote pe more people getting into his style and, um, and also his repertoire. 
you know, like want to widen the the canon of of this music uh, to make it more interesting. Is my personal opinion, and um, but also the style, like his how he ornaments and stuff like that. But that's obviously very difficult to do. And it, but um, yeah. However, educated or not about klezmer you are, um, you know, like it, I want to hear people's opinions about about, about this music. I think um, everybody here, pretty much, John, is pretty educated about yeah. <laughs> A little bit. We're speaking to a fairly rarefied audience, but that doesn't mean that everybody's not going to go away and look with fresh eyes now that you've drawn our attention to certain things and stylistic um, points. And also you've very kindly produced some uh, charts that we can go away and use our students, which is great. And, you know, as a fiddler, it's interesting for me looking at some of the things and thinking about whether they would apply to fiddle style as well, how we could, what we'd like to use and what we wouldn't like to use. And I'm sure that Craig's been thinking about that sort of thing as well. I wonder if that double stop stuff, the pedal tones, comes comes from fiddle style. Yeah. It's a lot easier to do on a so, fiddle. Seems like it, isn't it? Space. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a lot of it, you know, I think not all of it, I think he's doing clarinet stuff, you know, but for sure, it really makes a lot of sense. A lot of these tunes, yeah, these tunes to me fit pretty well on fiddle. I mean, I've only worked up a few of them, but they're well, quite the fun. the upper thing, the upper pedal is a bit weird. We don't do that very often on the fiddle. Right. Like, I, yeah. I don't know the clarinetists do either. So. No, I don't think so. <laughs> That's, I mean, it sounds like quite mm, idiomatic. Maybe, you know, it's in that C section of uh, Z the Zion, Rumors of Zion, uh, the Scotchner. Um, and that sounds like, a, you know, he's trying to be playing in a more Western classical style when he's doing that to me. Um, but yeah, um, so on my website, I put charts for the for the tunes and a special note for B flat clarinet players. Um, basically, I put the charts in the key that Chet and Schneider played them. But I've also put charts a tone down for people who play with B flat clarinet players. You might want to play it a tone down anyway, because uh, like playing... Remnants of Zion in F sharp isn't really ideal as a clarinet player. It's not going to be. I mean, you can, but you're not going to be able to get down all the stuff that Titian Schneider does on it. So uh, there's the option to play it a tone down for people. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. I hope everyone enjoyed it, and uh, thanks for coming and having this discussion. Okay. Well, thanks to you, John. Um, I'm putting up the contributions are welcome if you feel able to make one and also our next sessions we've got jordan hirsch coming in talking about brass matters um next week in fact uh, not in two weeks and he's going to also show some tricks of the trade it's going to be different from the talk he's giving for um for josh horovitz which is more about bandstand experience and sort of um, anecdotes and stuff this is more about klezmer brass and history of that and then we've got jeff washout talking about the mandolin uh, a couple of weeks after that so lots of nice stuff send along people if you can't make it yourself um do please send along your students oh jerry you haven't said anything you've been here all this time and you haven't no i was nervous. at the dentist getting my teeth cleaned <laughs> no, why do you think i didn't say anything, anything? because my it. mouth was open when they were picking them out the tartar between my teeth thank you for sharing anything else yeah, well, you know if i'm I, I am me you know as you know anybody who knows no. you know like i share things that maybe tmo tmi but anyhow is is this talk recorded can i get i didn't hear i just came in at the end yes. and i know nothing about this tobacco cutting guy yeah i forgot to ask john for permission but i have recorded it and it will be available privately to people who who are interested okay, in I'm reviewing gonna... or uh viewing for the first time private gershon yanko requests a, <laughs> exactly. a hearing i just want so, to say as well Thank you to Julian, really, for the for the recordings uh, that we hadn't heard before and, and for coming and speaking. It's really uh, great of you to join us. And also, Joel, for, for the discussion. It was really good to hear you, what you know about it, because obviously you know a lot. Um, and, yeah, and for everyone for coming. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, John. It's been a real, a real pleasure hearing all the stuff that you found out and been thinking about. And, yeah, thanks to everybody, and we'll see you... I'm sure at things before next week, but uh, then if you can make it. Thanks for coming. Great. Thanks. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.